that's in the morning. I'll explain it to you, not right now. Well, that's when you put your tefillin on the opposite side, so then you the opposite. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our weekly Tanya class. Today, we will, God willing, start chapter 14. It can be found in your Tanya bilingual edition on page 59. So up, till to, on to, uh, up to this point, Dal Terebe <coughs> elucidated on the uh, five levels within the Jewish people that the Talmud talks about, the two levels of tzaddik, the two levels of the sinful, and the bainan. Explained in great detail what each one, what, what each are. Chapter 14, he's going to say, and therefore, it is the responsibility it's in, the, it's in reach of every single person, perhaps not to be a tzaddik, but at least to be a bainani. And he's going to talk about that in chapter 14. Let's do it. And he will answer a number of the questions that we asked in the beginning of chapter 1. He's finally coming to answer some of them. I will remind you the questions, and uh, we will hopefully go through this entire chapter today, because it's not the most difficult of chapters. Shall we? Okay. The rank of the Bainini is one that is attainable by every man, and each person should strive after it. Every person can at any time or hour be an Bainini, an intermediate, because the intermediate, the Bainini man, does not rev revile evil. He doesn't. He's not uh, disgusted by evil. He doesn't despise evil. Like the tzaddik does. The tzaddik despises evil. That's a very difficult thing. That's not attainable to every person. But the Baini is not that person. He has, as we discussed so many times at length in these chapters, Baini still has a full-fledged human soul that is very much attracted to human and mundane and earthly and materialistic uh, ends and so on. So he's not the tzaddik. For the, because the, bain, the intermediate man does not revile evil. For that is the feeling entrusted to the heart. That's something of the heart. The, the tzaddik has indeed transformed his heart to want only godliness. But the bainini has not. And that's not so simple. And not all times are alike. By davening we said the bainini achieves that. His love for Hashem is so passionate and so strong and so revealed in his heart that it shuts out every other love. But not all times are equal. So what is true for the, what, what he feels during davening, he doesn't feel on a regular, you know, on different times. So therefore we don't, so he doesn't revile at evil. His task is only to turn away from the evil and do good. The evil is there, but he turns away from it. In actual practice, you see, this is the key word. What he is expected to do, <coughs> his task is only to turn away from evil and do good in actual practice, in deed, speech, or thought. Wherein the choice, ability, and freedom are given to every man, that he may act, speak, and think even what is contrary to the desire of his heart and diametrically opposed to it. He may want something that's evil. He may want that the great temptation for something that's mundane. But he has the ability and the choice, he has the freedom to choose to do what's diametrically opposed to what he wants. That is available to every single person at every single time, at every moment. You have the choice to what to allow into your mind. You have a choice to what to allow your mouth to speak. And you have the choice to decide what your hands and feet are going to do. That's it. And therefore, that's all. That's the rank of the Bainan. And therefore, every person has that ability. Even when the heart craves and desires immaterial pleasure, whether permitted or, God forbid, prohibited. <coughs> he says both, permitted or prohibited. Prohibited, of course, but even permitted. He can steal himself and divert his attention from it altogether. 
He has a temptation, he sees it, he wants it, but he can divert his attention from it. Declaring to himself, I will not be wicked even for a moment. He articulates this, he says to himself, I am not going to do this. This is very tempting, but if I do this, I will be evil. This will turn me into a Russia because I will not be prey. Why don't I want to be evil even for a moment? Because I don't want to be parted, because I will not be parted from and, or, and separated heaven from him, from the one God under any circumstance. Being mindful of the admonition. Torah says, you, your iniquities impose, interpose between you and God. When you do a sin, you do something that's prohibited, that's unholy, that separates you from God. And you have the ability, you say to yourself, I am not going to be separated from God under no circumstances. And therefore, by knowing that and articulating that in your mind and your even your mouth, that will hold you back from doing what you shouldn't do. So that's available to everyone. Nay, my real desire is to unite my nefesh ruach and neshama with him. What do I really want? I want to connect it. My unite my nefesh ruach and neshama, meaning my thoughts, feelings, and and behaviors with him through investing them in his blessed three garments. How do you connect Hashem? How do you connect your nefesh ruach and neshama, your soul with God? There's only one way to do it, and that is by namely, by by that's through investing them, meaning the soul, your souls, this the the your, your, the, the life of your soul to invest them. In his blessed God, in, in his blessed three garments, and God's in the blessed in the the holy garments of Torah mitzvahs, right? We learned this before. Uh, let's read that again. Nay, the, I, my real desire is to unite my nefesh ruach and Hashem, in other words, my soul, with Him, meaning Hashem, through investing them, meaning the powers of the soul, in His blessed three garments. Namely, in action, speech, and thought dedicated to God, His Torah, and His commandments. By virtue of the love of God that is hidden in my heart, as in the heart of all Jews who are called lovers of thy name. Period. Okay. Rabbi, what is Ruach? Ruach. There's, three le- there's five levels of the soul, but we talked in, mainly in these chapters about three of them. The three levels of the soul. But here you talk about two souls. No, 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 no. This, this each soul has all all five levels. Uh, oh, We're talking about the God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah. I, I explained them in chapter three, if you remember. Over there, we explained that nefesh is the behavior aspect of the soul, ruach is the feeling aspect of the soul, and 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 nesham is the intellectual aspect of the soul. So what do we call we call the God we call nesham? It's a general name for the whole neshama, but within the soul itself, there are different levels. So the neshama has a neshama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Correct. And the nefesh has a nefesh. No, the, the, the soul is called the neshama. That neshama has five parts. Correct. Nefesh, ruch, neshama, chayi, yichid. What do you call the human? The nefesh abahamit. The human soul is called the Nefesh Abahamit. It's not called Nefesh. It's called Nefesh Abahamit, yeah. It's like different Nefesh, but there are some But that Nefesh it doesn't have five levels. I don't that that Nefesh doesn't have five levels. It okay. does have it doesn't have the five levels of Nishama that the godly soul has. Three? It does have three, yeah. But um, it may even have a fourth. But the point is let's not caught up get caught up with how many levels it has. The point is that the, the Baini says to himself, under no circumstances do I want to be separated from God, and therefore I'm not going to sin, that you have the ability. Instead, what I do want is to be united with Hashem. How do you unite with Hashem? By investing your nefesh, ruach, and neshama in the three garments of Hashem, which are his Torah mitzvahs, meaning the action of Torah, the speech of Torah, and the thought of Torah. And I can do it. And how do you accomplish this? Because you do have a love for Hashem. We're going to learn later in chapter 18 that every Jew has a hidden love in his heart for Hashem. He has a natural love for Hashem. 
Bakuri says, by virtue of the love of God that is hidden in my heart, as in the heart of all Jews who are called lovers of thy name. Even the most unworthy among the worthless is capable of sacrificing himself for the sanctity of God. Surely, if the, we, Al-Tarebbe says in chapter 18 and 19, at great length, we'll talk about his fascinating chapters. Basically, he says over there that every Jew has the potential to sacrifice his life for God. It was in an earlier chapter, too. We spoke about that, yeah. We spoke about that. But it yeah. wasn't in the chapter. It could be it was. It could be it was. I don't have to remind myself. We just speak about it, yeah. So every Jew has the ability to, 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 to give up his life for Hashem. When the push comes to shove it, you're forced to the wall, and they force you to convert to, to some other. Why don't you give up? Your, you know, you're, you're ready to die for Hashem. So if that's true, that a person is ready to give up the ultimate, everything for Hashem, so even if you're not pushed to the wall, you're not coerced, you just have a little Yitzhahara to do something wrong right now. Of course you'll be able to overcome that. We're not asking you to not die for Hashem. We're asking you to die to give five minutes for Hashem. Don't do this little stupid act. So if I can give up my life for Hashem, I certainly can give my, 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 my time for Hashem. And not allow myself to fall prey to the dictates and the wants and the temptations of the animal soul. Easier said than done. Right? But it's possible. It definitely is available and possible for each one of us. Look what he says. Even the most unworthy among the worthless is capable of sacrificing himself for the sanctity of God. Surely I am not inferior to him. I'm going to be less than him. I'm going to give up, give in to my temptation. If he can, the worthless of the worthless are ready to give up their life for Hashem. I'm less than him. So therefore, I will have to do is overcome this temptation. So of course I could. It is only, and this is key, it is only that a spirit of folly has overcome him. A spirit of foolishness overcomes him. And he imagined that committing a sin will not affect his Jewishness. And his soul will not be severed thereby from the God of Israel. Forgetting also about his love of God which is hidden in his heart. It's the spirit of folly that gets us to sin. What does the spirit of folly tell us? If you eat something that's not kosher, you're, going to be, you're not Jewish anymore. That's going to affect your Jewishness. No, the people don't think that it does. But that's the spirit of folly. Of course it affects you. It affects you big time. You get you separated from Hashem when you do that. So the spirit of folly also makes us forget that we have, a, it makes us, it distracts us from reminding ourselves all the time that we have a natural love for Hashem. And again, I said that the, the, the discussion about the natural love for Hashem will be discussed at length in chapter 18 and 19. So I'll leave the discussion for there. But the point is, we do have it. And that love is so strong, is so real, that it has the ability to get a Jew to give up his life for Hashem. That's how powerful that love is when you reveal it. It's, the problem is it's hidden. So the spirit of folly tells you, makes you forget that, it distracts you, you shouldn't think about that. And it also tells you doing this sin is going to separate you from God, make you not, you know, threaten your Jewishness. No. We don't think that we're, we're jeopardizing our Jewishness when we do a sin. For some people, eating on Yom Kippur is absolutely out of the question. For others, converting out of the faith, that's it. Over there, there's no more spirit of folly. Over there, you know, your Jewish is severed, finished. You do that, you're over. So most people won't do that, even at the cost of life. But a lesser sin, eating something that's not kosher, doing something, in, uh, saying, uh, you know, not being honest, or whatever other sin, not putting on the do, not shaking a lulav on sukkahs. Okay, that's going to make me. That's going to sever my Jewishness. That's going to threaten my Jewishness. That's what the spirit of folly tells us. 
You can get away with it. You're still a good Jew. Don't worry. You're still Jewish. It's not a problem. But it's foolish. It's not true. I mean, it's true that you're still Jewish, but it's putting a very serious um, wall between you and God. And that means that your Jewishness is terribly affected by that. So it's the spirit of folly that gets us to sin. But that's what, what the person says to himself. I'm going to allow my spirit of folly to tell me that. But for me, as for me, I have no desire to be such a fool as to deny the truth. And what's the truth? That every sin separates me from my God. And I can't allow that to happen. So you have that ability. That's, that's available to every Jew to choose what to think, speak, and do. You can't, you can't choose what to love. But you could choose what to, what to say, what to think, and what to do. I don't remember if I told you the story of the Chassid that went to the, uh, I believe it was the Magad of Mezrich. And he asked him if he can help him. He says, I have bad thoughts. And I get there terribly distracted during my davening, during the day. And these thoughts keep coming in, ne evil, negative thoughts. And I don't know what to do. Help me out. So he told him to go visit Rav Wolf of Shetomi. Both in Shetomer, lived in Shetomer. And he went. So he went, he made the trek. Yeah, yeah, the Comes to, the, did I tell you on Tuesday night? Or I told you on I Shabbos? Again, not really good, but froze himself up. Right, right. Oh, so I did no, tell you. So he went there. And he comes, he looks for the house. Was, uh, where the wolf, they told him on that block. He looked for how that was lit up. Because he knew he was learning at night. So there was a lamp on. Uh, you know, he had a, and he sees the house. He starts knocking on the door. And he clearly hears people inside. They're there. They're up. So he knocks on the door and no one comes to answer. He knocks harder. And it was a freezing night. It was cold outside. And he's freezing. And, and they're not opening the door. And this is going on for a long time. And he's really, really beginning to worry what in the world is going on. And he hears them. Tzadik, Rabvolf, a Jew. Someone's knocking on your door, even if it's not Jewish. It's a human being. He's freezing outside. Comes... Come open the door. No, he's not opening the door. A long time later, finally, Rav Wolf comes to the door. How can I help you, sir? So he says to him, I came over here um, on the instruction of the Maggid to help me figure out how to... Um, oh, I think he told him, I know why you're here. He says, I know why you're here. And I, th I answered your question by not answering the door. Because I wanted you to know that in your house, you are the boss, who you allow in and who you don't allow in. It's the same thing with your mind. You have full control what thought to allow into your mind and what thought, what thought not to allow into your mind. He was standing at the door. I could have opened the door whenever I wanted. I chose not to. All you have to do is make a choice. Say, I'm not allowing you have full control who enters your mind and who does not. What thought enters your mind and what thought does not. And that's all it takes is making the decision that I'm, I'm not letting you in. I hear I showed you. I'm in full control. He stood outside and I decided not to let you in and I didn't let you in. Then he said, come in and give you a hot tea. He warmed him up. He gave him everything he needed and he that was the lesson he wanted to teach him. Powerful lesson. But that's what Al Rebbe says in chapter 14. You have full control who enters your mind and who doesn't. What enters your mind and what not? Understood from the theoretical point of view. Practically. Uh, what? Understood from the theoretical point of view. Practically. I don't know what you're going to do. I think to me, but sometimes there are some thoughts that is not easy. So you can. Can try to take it out, but sometimes it came back. Comes and back, you don't let it in. You shoot it out of you. You, you, you try, but you know it's coming back. It's difficult yeah. to say. Oh, I this guy knocked on the anymore. door for an hour, and you didn't let him in. He keep he, the knocks kept kept coming. He kept knocking, and he decided I'm not letting it. <laughs> yeah, the thoughts keep knocking on your on your door on your mind, and they they come in. You gotta shoot them out. You gotta send them away. Well, how do you send away a thought? You start thinking about something else. 
You can't think about two things at the same time. So if a negative thought comes into your mind, what's the answer? Don't fight the thought, just start thinking about something else. Think about your wife, think about your kids, think about God, think about Torah, think about business, think about whatever. Any bad thought that comes into your mind, divert your attention from it right away and start thinking about something else. My son's bar mitzvah, memory, of this, that, my last vacation. Think about whatever you want. Don't let that thought in. And no thought can get in if you're thinking about something else. A human mind is not capable of thinking about two separate things, two different things at the same time. That's, that's in our ability. You also have the ability to decide what to say. You're going to speak this piece of gossip now or not. You can't tell me I was forced. I want to, that you're forced. You, what you want is not in your hands. But what to do about, to allow that want to manifest itself in your behavior, that you have full control. And certainly with what to do. You have, this, you have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to do this now. That's the bill. That's the bainini. The bainini is the one that we're asked is asked to control his thought, speech, and action. That we have the ability. It is different, however. It is different, however, with something that is entrusted to the heart, namely that the evil should actually be despised in the heart and abhorred with absolute hatred or even not quite so absolutely, that's different. That is already something that the Benini doesn't have that ability. This cannot be attained truly and sincerely except through great and intense love of God, the kind of ecstatic love of the, and divine bliss which is akin to the world to come. That's the tzaddik. Of this experience, the rabbi said, Thy world will thou see in thy life. And not every man can attain this state. For this is in the nature of the gracious reward. That's what Hashem, that's the gift that Hashem gives us for doing good work for him. But that's a reward, that's a gift that Hashem, that you can't attain that on your own. As is written, I will make your priestly office a rewarding service. So the reference over here is to this gift. Hashem is giving the priests a gift. So he can give you a gift. What's the gift that he would give you? Something from above. What's a gift? A gift is something you receive from someone else. You didn't earn it. But here's the interesting thing. What's a gift? There are three things. There's a salary, a gift, and an inheritance. What are the differences between these three things? It's obvious. It's obvious. For an inheritance, you work nothing. You didn't do a thing. You can be the worst son and inherit your father. Automatically, you inherit your father. You can be the nasty son. What's a gift? To receive a gift already, you have to do already a little something for the person that, want, that, that inspired him to give you a gift. But you didn't give, you didn't do, you didn't, uh, there's a difference between a gift and a wage. A wage, you, you, you earned every dollar of it, every penny of that wage you earned. You, it's $15 an hour, $20 an hour, you worked a full hour, you earned $15, you earned $20. You worked at the end of the week, you worked your 40 hours, you get your wage. What you put in is what you get out. A gift is different. A gift, sometimes the person that's giving you the gift gives you a lot more than what you, than you, than the, 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 than the nice thing you did for him. But he feels gracious towards you, so he gives you, a, he gives you a gift. A gift, you didn't earn a gift as much as you earned a wage. But you, got, you had to do something to get that gift. With inheritance, you didn't have to do anything. So God says over here, the verse, the point that the Rebbe is making, the Bainini works hard enough. <coughs> Eventually, if he's lucky enough, not everyone gets it, but sometimes Hashem gives him the gift to become a tzaddik or to have a, a semblance of a tzaddik's experience. He didn't earn it. Like, you, it's not a wage. You didn't know oh, you did this, you get this. No. 
It's a gift. But you did something for it. You had to work to something towards it. Anyway, the point is, what's the Alter Rebbe saying over here? When it comes to love, when it comes to the matters of the heart, that you should revile evil, for that you have to, it, it's like a seesaw. The more you love Hashem, the more you despise evil. As we spoke about this in chapter 10, if you remember. Because hate and love are two opposites. The more you love something, the more you hate that which is against the, 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 the subject of your love. So the tzaddik which loves Hashem completely, or the incomplete tzaddik which is not perfect, he will revile evil, either fully or not so fully. But he will revile evil. The Bain doesn't revile evil because he doesn't have that love. But he could get a gift from Hashem. Let's read this again. That's on page 59, from the bottom of the right column. It is different, however, with something that is entrusted to the heart, namely that the evil should actually be despised in the heart and abhorred with absolute hatred, or even not so uh, quite absolutely, like by the tzaddik, that's not complete. This cannot be attained truly and sincerely, except through great and intense love of God, which is this what a tzaddik experience, the kind of ecstatic love and divine bliss which is akin to the world to come. Of this experience, the rabbi said, thy world will thou see in thy life. That bliss you see, and that's what heaven is about. So God, sometimes you can have a little bit of that here on earth if you're a tzaddik. And not every man can attain this state, for this is in the nature of the gracious reward as is written, I will make your priestly office a rewarding service, as is explained elsewhere. So that God gives a gift to the tzaddikim. He gives them a soul that has the ability to attain that level. You following me or not? Not every baini has that soul. He may, be, he may not even be able to attain it ever. All he can attain is to take full control of his thought, speech, and action. That everyone can attain. But to hate and to despise evil, despise ungodliness, that, that's a tzaddik. And that's a gift from heaven. To be able to have that kind of love, that's a gift from heaven. And not every man can attain the state for this is in the nature of the gracious reward. It's a gift from heaven. It's a reward as it is written. And I will make your priestly office a rewarding service. Sadiq has it all the time. The Bain just has it during Davin sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes we'll learn later that Hashem will give it to him as a gift. Sometimes. Now we come back to one of the questions that the al Rebbe asked in the beginning of Tanya. If you want to read it with me, I'll, we'll go back to chapter one. Go back to chapter one. It's on page one. On the right column, second paragraph. To understand all the aforesaid clearly. You with me? To understand all the aforesaid clearly and explanations needed. As also, here are the words I'm looking for. As also to understand what Job said in Baba Basra chapter one in Talmud. Lord of the universe, that has created righteous men, and thou has created wicked men. So we need to understand that as the Alter Rebbe, for it is not preordained whether a man will be righteous or wicked. That's up to you. So what do you mean you created righteous and you created wicked? That goes against everything we believe, that that's up to you. 
whether you'll be righteous or wicked. So the Al-Qarab answers, now, answers that now here in chapter 14. Look back over here. So the question is, is God created different types of men? That's the question. But yet it says that no, God you created a righteous person. You created a wicked person. God creates a righteous and wicked. That's up to you. That's your freedom of choice. That's the question. Yeah. So over here, the Alter Rebbe answers it. As is, um, therefore did Job say, thou didst create Sadikim and created Rishoyim. It is also found in Tikkun Ezor that in the souls of the people of Israel there are many kinds of gradations and distinctions. Pious men, strong men, who gain mastery over their nature, scholars of the Torah, prophets, Sadikim and so forth, note there. In other words, now it makes sense what, what Job said. Because indeed, Hashem did create tzaddikim. What is a tzaddik? This lofty soul that has the ability to attain such a high lofty level of love. That is a gift from heaven. That is created by Hashem. Only There's only a few select people that have that ability. Most of us were created as bainanim, to be able to achieve the level of the bainanim. So... What Job says, you created Sadiq and created Rishoyim, it doesn't mean what we thought it meant, that God creates people who sin and God creates people who don't sin. That's not what he means. That doesn't, that's not decided by God, that's decided by you and me, by every human being. What he means is that God creates certain souls that have the potential to be a Sadiq. And not everyone has that potential indeed. And that's why he says you created tzaddikim, meaning you created certain souls that cannot reach the level of a tzaddik. Not all of them. Not all souls could. But he doesn't mean you created people that do mitzvahs and created people that sin. That he didn't create. That's not God's doing. That's your doing. He meant to say that God, God created such people that can reach such a level of tzaddik, which is a whole different level. So you can have people that will never sin, but they're still not tzaddikim. The rank of a tzaddik God created by giving them the ability to be to reach that level. Sure, he has to work hard to become a tzaddik. We couldn't understand that in chapter one. You have to know what all these souls are. You no, know, okay. couldn't at that time. We didn't. No. Now we continues. Now let's read that again. Therefore did Job say, Thou did create Sadiqim. <coughs> now it makes sense. But that's a level that God did create, the ability to become a Sadiq. It is also found in Tikkun Isaiah <coughs> that in the souls of the people of Israel there are many kinds of gradations and distinctions. There are pious men, strong men who gain mastery over their nature, scholars of the Torah, prophets, Sadiqim, and so forth. So but there also it says Sadiqim. <laughs> As a gift. Huh? As a gift. Wait. He created a tzaddik as a gift. As a gift, yeah. Mm-hmm. To be able to become a tzaddik. To, to become. If you if you work hard at it. So you see of it clearly that God did create certain types of neshamas that have more of an in, more of an inclination to certain things. That doesn't mean that He decides whether you're going to do sins or mitzvahs. No, that's up to you. I'm sure, there's been some waste of neshamas that He maybe maybe right maybe He did. He took this neshama that had the potential to be a tzaddik and tzaddik and wrong Al-Kareb, choices. Al Kareb is going to say over here. That for this reason you should be you should try to be a tzaddik because huh? you, you don't know. If you try very very hard to be a tzaddik, right. you don't have that neshama. Right. You never get there. Now the Alter Rebbe is going to say it's going to explain that it could be that sometimes Hashem will gift you and say you know you're trying hard, will put into you a new level of you. Let, let's let's read it now. Rebbe's words. <coughs> Over here he's going to answer another few questions. Now we can understand the redundancy of the oath. Be righteous, tzaddik, and not be wicked. You remember the beginning of the Tanya? Go back to chapter 1, literally, on the first few lines. How does the Tanya start? It has been taught, 
An oath is administered to, to a person before birth, warning him, be righteous and not be wicked. Why do you have to say both, be righteous and not be wicked? If you're going to be righteous, you're not going to be wicked. Or don't be wicked it means you're righteous. Why the redundancy? So now he answers it. Be righteous, sadiq, <coughs> and not be wicked, which is unintelligible at first glance. Since he is warned, be righteous, where is the need to put him an oath? Again, that he shall not be wicked, it sounds redundant. The answer is that in as much as not everyone is privileged, the answer is that in as much as not everyone is privileged to become a tzaddik, nor has a person the full advantage of choice on this matter, in this matter to experience true delight, love of Hashem, and to actually and truly abhor evil, so he is consequently adjured a second time, thou shalt at, any, at least not be a wicked. Be righteous. And if you're not the type of person that could be righteous, at least don't be wicked. That's why they do both. Because not, don't be wicked, that's for sure up to you. Be righteous or not sure. So if, they, they, if you can't reach that, at least don't be wicked. In other words, be a bainini. Here the right of choice and freedom is extended to every person to check the, the, the drive in his, of his heart's desire and to conquer his nature so that he shall not be wicked even for a moment throughout his life, whether in the realm of turn away from evil or in the, that of do good with being no there being no good other than Torah. That is, that is the study of the Torah which balances them all. In other words, you have the choice to not be wicked, in other words, to never do something that's wrong, whether staying away from a sin or making sure to do all the, the, the good mitzvahs. And good is Torah. Yeah, Torah is good. Ain't teivel a teira, says the sages. There's nothing that's really referred to as good other than Torah. In other words, to learn Torah as much as you could. So that we have the ability to saturate our life with good deeds and never do something bad. But could you reach the level where you abhor evil? You reach such a level of love for Hashem that you chased away your whole na- evil nature? No. That's why they say that this, uh, the oath goes double. Be righteous, and if that's not your ability because Hashem didn't give you that soul, at least be, don't be, be obeying me. Don't be wicked. Nevertheless, that's what he's saying. Now, sound is a problem over here. Why would Hashem administer an oath to a soul? Who's administering this oath? Before you're born, who administers this oath? In heaven, they administer this oath before a soul is born. They know if this soul is possible to be a tzaddik or not. So if it's not possible for this soul to be a tzaddik, why even tell him to eat tzaddik, be a tzaddik? Why administer him the first part of that oath if in heaven they know this is not a soul that could be a tzaddik? It's to do with God's realm, in his presence, in the physical realm. You still have to perform the, the mitzvah. That's okay. it. Tell him, don't be a bainini and don't be a bainini. To tell a soul that can't be a tzaddik, be a tzaddik, the suits is foolish. If you're telling me that there are certain souls that will never be a tzaddik, they're not meant to be tzaddik, then why before they come down there, they're told be a tzaddik? Makes no sense. I think that the answer is going to be there's a way that it could become that, well, we'll see. So that's what he's talking about. Nevertheless, a person must set aside specific periods in which to commune with his soul in order to cultivate the abhorrence of evil. As, for example, reminding himself of the admonition of our sages. Now, be careful what we're going to read now. This is a heavy statement. I will explain it. Don't jump in. That women are a vessel full of filth <laughs> and in like manner. Huh? Okay, let me give a little introduction to this part of the Tanya. And then we'll explain what he's saying over here about women. What's the problem of the per- a human being, the Bainani? What is our problem? What's the frustration here? That we struggle. Yeah, you're struggling all your life. 
Every day is a mitzvah. That's crazy. What does that mean? It's one thing if I told you for 10 years, you work hard, and you can get rid of your evil inclination. Now, that'd be something to work towards. That'd be, you know, as a man, you send, imagine you send that soldier to war. You send him, you can win this war. But imagine the American chief of staff or the judge sends the soldiers to a war and tells them, you're never going to win this war, but go fight anyway. That's the most demoralizing thing you can ever tell a soldier. Think what God is telling us over here. You'll never be outside. You'll never vanquish your evil. So you're going to fight for the rest of your life. What kind of inspiring, uh, what kind of inspiring message is that? It's the most demoralizing, depressing message. You, yeah, you're here to fight for 120 years and never win. You can't. You'll never be able to banish the evil from your heart. It's terrible. It's not, I'm going to work for 20, 30, 40, 120 years and never win this battle. So at great length, Dr. Rebbe is going to talk about this in chapter 35. But Obe, he mentioned something interesting. So in other words, the, the problem is that really what we're trying to achieve, wouldn't it be nice if the, the battle is over? We achieved peace and quiet, right? We only want God. I don't have any negative desires anymore. Wouldn't that be nice? Isn't that, I mean, if, if I'm going to fight, I'd like to be able to win that fight. And get rid of the evil out of my system. But we can't. So the Al-Tarebbe says over here, you should try. So let's see how he does it. What's the problem? You're, you're, you're davening, let's say, you're trying to do a good thing, and suddenly a, a negative thought comes to you. Let's say a thought of an erratic thought that distracts you terribly, right? You're thinking about women. And that's a major distraction for you. So what do you do to a person like that? To a man that has such thoughts. And men have such thoughts. So what do you do? So you tell them, push it out, push it out. Think about something else. Get into something else. Go in, divert it. Don't let it in. All right? Don't knock on the he knocks on the door. Don't let don't open the door for that thought, right? And you say it, but it comes back right away two seconds later, three minutes later. And you always have to shut the door and shut the door, not let it in, not let it in. Is that, a man, is that the way we're supposed meant to live for the rest of our life? Thoughts flying in, thoughts being kicked out, thoughts coming back in, kick them out. I mean, this is not a way to live. So let's say a man is addicted to this. And our nature is to be, to want this, this thing in life. So how do you get rid of this? I mean, and, and it's, it's a negative thing, especially as it relates to other women. But in general, to be obsessed with this, with this area of life, you know, co constantly, even if it's your own life. Certainly, if it's others, where it's pro prohibited completely to think about fans, you know, erotic thoughts re as it relates to others, God forbid. So you can tell a person, throw the thing out of your mouth. The minute it goes in, shut it out. Good. We'll try to do that, and we'll succeed. If you want, you have the ability to succeed. But the Al-Tarebbe said, you know, at, at some point, let me give you some advice how to, once and for all, really get rid of the desire for that. So he tells a man, he's talking to a man's Yetzirah, basically. He's talking to a male, the male evil inclination. What is a human? What is a body? What is a body? Body is a sack of meat and bones and blood. If you think about it, is if you open up a body, you'd be attracted to it. You throw up. You'd run out of the room. If you analyze what's inside the human body, you'd be you'd be attracted to it. <laughs> you want nothing to do with it. You'd run for your life, right? <laughs> now the Rebbe says that's exactly how you should think about it. You're attracted to this. To this is that what you're attracted to? Think of what's just skin deep. <laughs> I mean, below, just be below that surface. 
Are you still attracted? It's, 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 what does he call it over here? It's a vessel full of filth. It's what it is. What is a human body? It's a vessel full of filth. So I work on 16 year old boys? He's talking <laughs> to the male Yetzirah here. Now, if a woman has the same problem, if a woman had that problem, women have less of this problem than men have. But if a woman did have this obsession, he would tell them the same thing. Think of the men as, as a vessel full of filth. Because that's what we are. That's what a human being, that's what a human body is. It's a vessel full of filth. So knock that into your head a little bit. <laughs> Picture that in your head a little bit, then you won't want it. And you'll get it out of your mind. Yeah, no, it happens when, when you're with your wife. <laughs> then what do you do now? You got that in your head. The problem is not that. The problem is how do you convince yourself that it's a, a vessel full of filth? Then that the default is that you're attracted. Al Tarebbe says, think one, one, go one step further. What, what is this that you're attracted to? A vessel full of filth is what this is, basically. That one day the worms are going to have a field day with him. And have a barbecue or a party. What? I, I find this thought a little dehumanizing. <laughs> Dehumanizing, and, and do you find being being obsessed with erotic thoughts not dehumanizing? No, that's worse. That's I much more dehumanizing. No, as we take it for granted, but in the Al Karabi's world, that's that's what's dehumanizing. It's a profound thought. I understand. <laughs> I'm just wondering if if you conditioned yourself every time you had an erotic thought. Let me ask you something. A, you wouldn't if you started. Let me ask you something. Eventually, would come happen. here. Let me tell you something. Go to addiction centers. You ever have you had anything to do with addiction well, centers? With you should never have anything to do with aversion therapies. Basically. What did they tell you? You're addicted to pickles. A person has an obsession with ice cream. He has an obsession. He can't stop eating what ice cream. He can't stop eating whatever. What, do, what do you think they tell him in therapy? They make him. They they make him hate it. They 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 try to convince him that this is horrible and disgusting and, and, and really not good for you. That's what you have to do. You have to make the addiction something that is abhorrent to you. Now, the Al-Tarebbe knows that every human being is born addicted to this to, to this desire. You, you can you run away from the, the reality, but that's the truth. Especially men. She stopped the man's Yitzhah. He said, you have a problem? It keeps coming into your head like you just said to me. So I can tell you, just keep throwing it out. But it would be nice one day to be able to say this, you know, leave me alone for two hours, you know. Or for two days or for two months. You know, I don't want to deal with this thought anymore. I have a way. You're addicted. This is the way to deal with it. It's not his advice. It's not, it's not his advice. This is from the Gemara. He calls the Talmud. It's a, it's a vessel full of dung. What are you attracted to? Think of it that way. Trust me, Howard. It's not dehumanizing. You know why? How many people I let, uh, come to me in two weeks or three weeks and tell me how many times did you think about a human being being a vessel full of dumb? You we'll see how, how successful this was. You better work on this. <laughs> yeah. Try it. Let's see how, how successful it is. In other words, it's not you. You'll never. Get, it's not going to be your default position. Suddenly, it's not dehumanizing at all. It's I'm stealing. Sure. It's not telling you to see this woman. It's so the concept. Every human being. That's what we are. It's a vessel full of dung, full of filth. For example, himself. when they're telling a, a smoker, you know, right? To, to they 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 say, put no, they no, point they out show you a, a exactly. Young. Exactly. They show you how harmful it is, how disgusting it is, how terrible it is. Kids that are addicted to Frankfurters, what are you going to tell them? You take them to a Frankfurter shop or wherever they make them and show them, this is what it is. You still like it? Probably not. If you knew what was going into Frankfurt, you would never look at it again. That's what they told me when I was a kid. I still And I still look at them. And I still eat them. Read the book, The Jungle. And I still eat them. Because it's not so easy. Because there's an attraction there. We all know it. So it's dehumanizing. If it's de if you need the dehumanization, that's what it is. If you're addicted, you got to have a, a certain... See, he's talking to the male Yetzirah. Not if a woman has the same Yetzirah, and some women do. 
it would be true too. He would tell the same thing. A man is a, is a, a vessel full of filth. But he has, but, but this is not about women. You understand? This is not about women. No, He's I talking also, to you. To he doesn't see women as a, a vessel full you're of filth. You're a 16 year old boy, and you're an 18 year old boy, and you've got biological urges, which are like literally, right. literally pinging you biologically, chemically. Right. Literally pinging you every. 15 seconds. Because they, they, they don't, because that's why in the film world they separate women from boys from girls. Because they're married. There's no connection. That's, yeah. That's why. Yeah. Not arguing with that. Because once you're married, you can, you can channel that desire to your wife. But before you're married, you're not allowed to channel that desire. And if it's going to be right there in front of you, you're going to go crazy. You're not going to be able to live. So they take, no, it's a total separation. And trust me, they survive. Don't get me wrong, it's not so easy and it's, it's a challenge and it's, it's always challenging. But, you know, the more you take them away, you take away that challenge from the front of before his eyes, you have a better chance. If our schools would have only boys and only girls schools, trust me, 50% of the world's problems would be gone. Would be? Would be gone. They'd be healthy, they'd be normal, they'd learn, they'd be... They wouldn't have HD and D. They wouldn't each all be on medication for HD, ADHD, what is it called, ADHD, or whatever else. They'd be focused. They'd be able to learn like normal people. But no, you have to put them right in front of their face, and they, they don't make a dress code because, oh, boy, that's terrible. So what happens? What is the boy seeing all day? Like? That 16-year-old you're talking about, he's able to learn and focus. Give me a break. It's ridiculous. Then we wonder why they're off the wall. But that's not really either. You would have learned better. <laughs> Imagine you learned in a mixed school and you weren't allowed to ever yeah, act. You had, you, you yeah. But even if you do have a uniform, it's not the best. It's better to be separate. Than it. <laughs> Whatever, let's move on. So what's he saying over here? Let's read again from Nevertheless. <coughs> Nevertheless, a person must set aside specific periods in which to commune with his soul. To commune with the soul, it's an interesting word. In order to cultivate the abhorrence of evil, to, to get to hate evil. For example, reminding himself of the admonition of our sages that women is a, a woman is a vessel full of filth, and the light in like manner, so too all dainties and delicacies turn into vessel, a vessel, what happens to this delicious uh, the, the steak that you're so attracted to? 15 minutes later, what do you think it is? Yeah. You wouldn't look at it again. You don't want to look at it. It's disgusting. It's dung. It's full of filth. Likewise, in regard to all pleasures of this world, the wise man foresees what becomes of them. For in the end, they rot and become worms and dung. So look ahead. Conversely, let him delight and, rejo and rejoice in God by reflecting on the greatness of his blessed day. So put your head to that a little bit, or a lot, and to the best of his capacity. He may well realize that he cannot attain to this degree with a full measure of truth except in illusion. You will you'll feel this excitement and love for Hashem. You may not feel it like a tzaddik. It may be a little bit of an illusion. Nevertheless, he should do so. He should do his part in an effort to uphold the oath administered to him. Be righteous. You do your part in trying to be righteous. To start seeing the, 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 the worldliness as garbage and godliness as a delight. And God will do as, as he sees fit. Maybe you'll do something that you should be able to attain. Furthermore, habitude, habitude, when you get you habit yourself with something, reigns supreme in any sphere and becomes second nature. You do it again and you do it again and you do it again, it becomes second nature. So if you train yourself in this manner, this will become a little bit your nature. You'll start seeing things less desirable, and you'll see godliness as more desirable, and that become your nature. Therefore, if he accustoms himself to despise evil, it will do to it will 
it will to some extent become despicable in truth. <coughs> It'll become that way in truth. Similarly, when you accustom yourself to gladden his heart in God through reflection on his greatness for, for self-impulsion induces heavenly inspiration. I don't know these words, self-impulsion, but I know what the Hebrew is. It means when he arouses himself here below, it will uh, create a response from above. Right. Induces heavenly inspiration. So you do your part, Hashem will do his. With all that, perhaps a spirit from above will descend upon him and he will merit something of the spirit, a ruach, that is rooted in some tzaddik that will attach itself to him. You will not get a whole neshama of a tzaddik, but a spirit and spirit of the tzaddik will attach itself to you and you'll have that feeling for real, the feeling of a tzaddik, so that he may serve God with true joy as is written, Rejoice, O ye tzaddikim in God. Then will in truth be fulfilled in him of the avowed oath, Be righteous. So the al is saying something very profound over here. When you think about it, it's a masterful chapter. He's saying what you can attain without a doubt is to be a Bainan. The fact that from heaven they're telling you be righteous is not a waste. Because if you train yourself and you work at this, now it's not easy. To really delight in God and to start abhorring evil, you have to really train yourself. You have to think about this. Commune with your soul, as it says over there. Put yourself to this. To really see the, the, the delicacies of this world as vanity, absolute vanity and wastefulness and, and, dis, and, and, and filth. Because that's what they end up being. Well, we're talking about food pleasures. And the other pleasures are vanity also. They're, they're waste. So look ahead. Train yourself. Again and again and again. You never, you'll see what happens. It'll become second nature. I'm not there yet. I'm not even close. But I believe al that this is possible. And maybe God will do you the favor and give you the gift of uh, the Ruach of a tzaddik that will attach itself to you, to your soul. won't be a full-fledged soul of a tzaddik, but it will be something. And you truly feel the delight in Hashem. So be a tzaddik is not a wasteful oath. But could, will you reach it? Who knows? Try. You never know. It could work. But at least, if you're not going to be that, at least I'll tell Russia, don't be a Russia, be a Bain. That you for sure can be. It wouldn't be bad. No, it's not. It's got to be moving and everything and transforming. Right. So what, why? I mean, just because you can't have it all is a sign. Right. It's he not an argument for not trying, trying to achieve a glimpse. That's what he's saying. Of what the side is. That's what he's saying. And to lose. But first, you have to be a baby. You can't be a tzaddik before you're a baby. You can't expect to feel this if you're, you're going to sin. If you're going to come to your you know, ugly temptations. Or even not so ugly, the self, self-centered temptations. If you're going to be there, you're not going to be here. You know, that's where your interests are. You can't expect to have. The first You have to first be a baby. Then you can hopefully train yourself and do the exercises that he spells out of here in the second half of chapter 14, and maybe you can be lucky enough. Any questions? Okay, well. <laughs> sure. <laughs> of course. Well, now I have sentences. No sentences. You've been very good. I asked a question. Go right ahead. So I'm going to go back to question I asked you sometime. There's a lot of Orthodox people, you know, you know that, and they are. Why? There's so few Orthodox. Let's think about this. Now that you learned 14 chapters of time, you know what a Bainan is, yeah. you still have that question. 
you know how hard it is to be a manager? You mean never to sin, never to give in to your base desires. So, so my question, I guess, it's an incredibly difficult thing. Everybody to be a manager? He wants yeah. everyone to be a manager. Or did he intend to pursue being a manager? I'm sure that we could. No, he doesn't say to pursue and don't. You, you, if you're going to pursue, you could. In other words, he said you could be one. That would be, and you should be one. Yeah. You should be one. If it's so, they, why makes a miracle a miracle? What makes a miracle a miracle? It's not natural. Not natural. It's against nature. It occurs very few times. It, it depends. The time in the I desert, it happened every day. 50 right, times it shouldn't a day. happen every day. That makes it a miracle. It right. did happen every day in the mirror in the desert, but yeah, but that's what makes right. it a miracle. That's it's not natural. Yeah. And it doesn't happen. It only happens now. Day, nowadays, it doesn't happen in front. Correct. So if you go for that, that theory, if you see how many bainers, real bainers are in the world, they're very few. There are very few. So if asking that, you make a miracle. Something that is Well, that's not a miracle because it is not, you could by nature be a bain. It's not no. against your nature. That's the point. But it's uh, something that is very, very unusual. Yeah. It's very it hard. So. Isn't that you basically ask me? It sounds like God failed in his in his project. I think he, he put a bar too high. Too high. I, I, I can't see it. Though. I don't either. If you could learn how, I'm sorry. You could. What if you, they show you? Hey, you could be an astronaut. I want to know that I could be an astronaut. Now, am I going to become an astronaut? No. Is your kid going to become an astronaut? No. Why no? No, because that it's. No. So then you can't. If you can't. I could. So would that be it? I don't, I'm not, not, no, I'm not willing to put that much effort into that. It's not. So that, but that, uh, one second. But God didn't tell you to be an astronaut. Of course not. Okay. No, no. I'm, not saying I'm just saying, like, the fact that I know that there's this thing out there that I could do, it, it's not like I'm upset that there's this big... No, he's asking a different question. God wants 30, 15 million astronauts, and only 10 became astronauts. That right. sounds like a failure. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he's asking. That's not yeah. my understanding of the teaching. Yeah. Basically, when you start out here, I don't think the bind, there isn't a, it's not a bind you think it's not like you're a baby or you're not a baby. I think what the teachers are saying is, is that if you can eliminate your evil inclination, if you can act godly in the moment, in, in one particular action or then it, and, and if you are not tortured by that, and that becomes by not eating on your own So you're basically it's saying it's not an all or nothing game. It's not, no, absolutely, it's a process. So that the, the point is you can be a bane me in this, yeah, you can be a bane me in that, but you don't have to be a bane me as a matter of, 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 of a, as a binary yeah. definition, like you either are or you're not. My question. Well, you, you should. You, you could, and therefore well, you should. No, no, but no, you won't. That's the question, but that's not right. what we're talking about. No, no, no. My question is, does he want us to be a pain in God at the same time? Or, or I have moments? I think, think he would be. want you to be a pain in the 100% of the time, but he knows that it's a very difficult process, and he's, he'll, he's happy with every effort you make. And in Chapter 35, the al is ask, asks this question. What did God do over here? He put Bainanis into this world to fight for 320 years. What kind of a life is that? You're telling people you'll never you'll never win this battle. Because you're never getting rid of your evil inclination. So you're always going to be at war. We know that in our society, people are tired of war, right? We don't know why we want to fight wars anymore. How many soldiers could you lose, right? But the so what is the glimpse of what the society can See. It could, but it's not so easy. It's not, it's, it's a but it's a constant war, even for the Bainini. But that's the payoff. Uh, if that happens, but, but that's forget the payoff. I'm talking about the the, the the process. The process is never ending. The war is never ending. So Bottom line, the war is never process. ending. Process. So what? I will never. I'll never. I'll never be national. I'll never hit a. I'll never hit a 500 yard drive in a hole in one. And you're never going to try. It's not golf. your. It's not your mission. It doesn't stop you from playing golf. It doesn't even stop you from enjoying playing golf. Because you don't care about golf. No, because I don't need to be perfect to enjoy, in this case, 
It's not true. It's a very different thing, and I'll tell you why. Over here, God is telling you there's a constant knock on your door to sin, and you're always told never let that thought in, that 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 idea in. You're fighting all day against your evil inclination. Why are people religious? Because God wants them to be religious. God wants you to be religious. I don't know what what are you getting. Extent, at? To the extent that your free will has any impact at all, based on what on the most negative connotation is that you can never get to achieve human beings, and all you do is get to hit yourself in the head with a hammer. No, the bane he hits himself in the head with the all hammer. Right, so the bane he hits himself with a hammer. We're all on the way to being a bane. Forget on the way. I'm talking about the Baini that is already a Baini. He's constantly fighting. Okay, why is he doing this? Because that's the way he's created. He has no choice. He must fight. There's a battle and he has to win the war. Okay, so now but now he can't now win now the I'm war. Advancing. The problem is he can't now win I'm the advancing. war. Where is free will in that? The free will is are you going to win the war or not? Are you going to win the, are you going to give in to your evil inclination or you're not? You have the free will to say no to the evil inclination. Yes, that's fine. That's, that's the yeah. action. But what, why am I doing this? Because, because God mother, told you to do this. He God told you, be a Benini, not a Russia. So, so Dr. Rebbe asks that question. How could you put people in the world for 120 years without the ability to win the war? You're telling them to fight a battle and you're telling them, sorry, you're not going to win. What kind of a thing is that? How frustrating is that? You have no problem with that. You have no problem with sending a soldier into war saying, you're not going to win this war, you're just going to keep fighting for 120 years? You have no problem with that? And if he doesn't die, and if he doesn't die, then it's okay to send him into war for 120 years without a plan to win? There is no plan to win here. That's the point. There's no plan to win. So why are you going to become a Bainini? A Bainini is you're still what, fighting. Yes, but you have a plan. But the plan is to fight. And the plan win. is to fight to become a Bainini. No. And then when you're a Bainini, yeah. what happens? Forever. You're still fighting. You're still fighting. Forever. You're fighting to become a Tzadiki. No, you're but, but you, may, yeah, ben, you may never win. And he says to you, by the way, I want you to know, you're not going to be a Tzadik. So why are you doing it? But you uh, that's know. his question. What are you doing to these people? But you don't know if you will or not. It, it, but most people won't. He's saying most people are not. So yeah. send in people to fight a war that they can't win. What kind of a plan is that? Because some people will break through and become tzaddik. And how do we know who to? If it's only about God's will, and it's only about what he cares about, then sure, have everybody be building God's benefits here in this physical world by, by trying to be being me. Or being bain and knee and, and observing the mitzvot and the whole nine yards. And that's fine. And it's God's will and it becomes a non issue. But the real question, but I, but I think out here in It the, does in, become an issue, but even in, if it's God's will. Way, what is that? Is God's in will the, here? Us sitting at this table, yeah. there is a reason why we're sitting here. Yeah, go ahead. And it may even be an ego driven reason. Whatever the reason is. Although I would hope not. But there's certainly. These things always start with an ego-driven reason. Maybe because you were sinful and now you're miserable. Maybe you maybe maybe you're repenting for things that you've done. Maybe you need the peace of this. There's no peace in this. I uh, another conversation. But uh, well, one second. Yeah, no, I'm not. I don't mean to. Yeah, of course, if you're learning and you're liking it and you're growing, the point that Tareb is asking is a different question. The peace that you're experiencing, the Bain and Yos experiences. He loves what he's doing. He loves every time he learns. He loves davening. He loves the mitzvahs. He loves them. But all day long, he has temptations. Ungodly temptations that really frustrate him. And it's one thing if you say, work for 10 years and you'll no longer have these temptations. I'd be motivated. But if you're telling me going in, you're never getting rid of these temptations. And you're always going to be told, don't do it. Don't follow your temptation. Throw it out of your mind. Throw it out of your heart. Throw it out of your actions. For 120 years, I, I, I'm in a situation where I'm told battle without a plan to win the battle. <coughs> if I have three evil inclinations, and when I when I when I submit, when I give myself to those evil inclinations, and I don't resist them, and the result, I feel pain. People I love feel pain. Right. So there's all kinds of suffering. In the world. <laughs> 
if I can move <coughs> through my attempts of being a baby, eliminate those three out of the nine million that I have. But, but that's I not enough. He wants you to get rid of all nine million. And I'm less damaging to my loved ones. How can you say that there's nothing, there's nothing there? There is a lot there. He's not saying there's nothing right. here. So what are we talking about? We're I'm talking about it's a process. It's not it's not an but there's not a process. The process is that there's no end to this process. So That's what? the it's what do you mean? So what? So In other words, imagine you told that to a soldier. Because you're working towards self-perfection. Imagine you told a soldier, it's not you're never gonna perfect yourself. That's the point. I'd like to know that at the end of the process, I am perfect. But we're telling you clearly, no, you're not going to be perfect. You're always going to struggle. Uh, you already said that you're not even a being in the game. You're doing no. this full time, 24-7. Right. And it's frustrating. Okay, it's frustrating. Right. You know what I'm Would you change a single thing? I wouldn't because I'm, 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 I'm at the dis- point, So, then, done. You wouldn't change a thing. I don't I, What do you mean what change a thing? What do you mean by change a thing? thing what do you mean by change a thing? Like because it that. doesn't make any difference. You, if, Just because your path of self-perfection mm-hmm. isn't guaranteed that Jeez, it's right? not only it's, it's guaranteed. No, not if it's not guaranteed. It's guaranteed not to succeed. So what's the question that you're saying? That's my question. It's guaranteed that you're not going to succeed. I want you to understand the question. Yeah, I, 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 I understood both of you. I don't. You, you know why you're not asking this question? Because you really, I don't think you really understand what a bainin is. That's really possible. I don't think you really know what a bainin is. Nor do I. Nor do I. Because I'm not a bainin. You, you, you understand what the state of being a bainin is. What it means to overcome your inclination every second of your battle. All right. Well, I, I you do, don't know what that means. If you I do. understand the overcoming of a single, yeah, you do. You overcome. If you this. understand you overcome. the overcoming of a single, uh, yes or So basically, your answering is that that you did win the battle. There's a million, nine million battles, and you won nine million times. No, if, if I no, in my in my perfect world, there were nine million battles. I won three of them, and they were really important. That's not good enough. No, of course it's not good enough. Okay. Once you put down those three, right. there's the other nine million. But the point is, for a sinner like me. I get it. No, no. Right. I uh, believe me. That's not good enough. I, it's very good. The, pro, the, the point so that I'm making, it, the point that I'm making is, when you're talking to serious people that take serving God very seriously, yes. and they want to break the habit of, they want to really connect to Hashem, and they know that the real way to connect to Hashem is to love Hashem and to and to despise everything else. And they know, and they they're being told, "You are not gonna get there. Don't even try." This is childish. It's not childish at all. What you're telling a person is that he will forever battle. Okay. So there's no winning this battle. What do you mean? So why is that not a problem to you? It is a problem. Sure, it it's a problem. a problem. Because if you get a glimpse of if you can if you if you can perfect yourself enough to move through these. All of us. You can perfect yourself can you to be your your thought unity? your okay. thought, speech, and action could be perfected, but nothing beyond that. And that's that's incredible when you think about it. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Okay. Let me let me give you an example. Hold on. Before you say, before you say, let me say something. I'm screaming right now. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Imagine you marry your wife. What's the goal in the marriage? Tell me what the goal in the marriage is. It's a question. It's not a rhetorical question. Give me the answer. To create a home and a family. Okay. Create a home and a family. I agree with that. Let me go one step further. Between the two of you. Let's talk about the goal between the two of you. Two separate people. We started out, my, when I grew up in New York. My wife grew up in Israel. I grew up in this family. Polish. She grew up Russian. Two different worlds coming together. What's the goal? We think different. We, we think to different. We don't love the same things. We see the world different. What now we're standing under the chuppah? What would you like to achieve at the end in fifty years on your fiftieth anniversary that you're celebrating when you're seventy-five years old? What would you like to say? Oh, in these fifty years, now we think alike. And we love the same things. We're attracted to each other in the same. We th- we're the same. We morph together. That is what we want. That is what you want. But imagine someone says, "You're always going to be attracted to another woman." 
you're always going to be attracted to other things that she hates. You're always going to battle against to do what your wife wants. You're not going to want it. You want it. You love. You're going to be looking this way, that way, the other way. You're always never going to really mesh. What your wife loves, you're going to hate. Imagine that. And what your wife hates, you're going to love. And you say, wait a minute, this is not a marriage. So you say, okay. I, but by the 50th anniversary, you, you, you could accomplish that. Okay. I hear you. It's worthwhile. But imagine someone said you're going to die hating what she loves, loving what she hates. And you're telling me that's not a problem? It is. That's a major problem. That's not mad. That's a one. It's a funny marriage. That is a funny marriage. Says the Alter Rebbe, the Baini came to the Alter Rebbe for Yechidus and says, Rebbe, I want to marry God. I can't marry him. Everything he loves, I hate. Everything he hates, I love. What kind of a Jew am I? Everything he hates, I love. And everything he loves, I'm not so attracted to. Imagine, are you married? You're in the same house, you're in the same everything, and she thinks she loves this. You hate you hate what she loves, and you love what she hates. Imagine that. Would you think you'd get along with such a wife long term? You may get along because you're just working it out, and you say, you know, I know that you hate this. I'm not going to do it for you. And I know that uh, you, you love this, but I hate it, but I'll, you know, I won't do what you hate. You want to grow. You want to one day graduate from that. You want to mesh with your wife. The baby, he wants to mesh with God, and he can't. It frustrates him. He's going crazy. He hates, he loves what God hates. God hates sin. He's attracted to it. He, and he says, wait a minute, I'm davening. I'm working. I'm Ten years later, he's still loving what God hates. And he's still hating what God loves. Okay. So, so he's why, going crazy. Why? What kind of life is this? Well, he says to the Rebbe, to the Alter Rebbe, what, what did, why did God put me into this? Right. So what's, what's his plan? Not, not, Are we ever going to marry God? Are we ever going to mesh with him or not? Answer. It's Rabbi the, Spolter setting it up. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been with you now in too many classes. Yeah. I'm setting it up. What do you mean I'm setting it up? Of course there's not the Are you telling me that I'm, 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 I'm serious? This is a serious question. Of course I have the answer. In chapter 35, the Al-Tarebbe <laughs> said... <laughs> That's why I wasn't worried, because I knew there had to be an answer. You got it. Let me ask you this question. Which chapter for me? Are we going to leave long enough to get to chapter? Yeah, sure. As long as we don't have so many questions. No, 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 ask your questions. I the end of the class. It's at the end of the class. It's very good. Pretty red chapter. I did it to my favorite. I'm going to make it to chapter 35. 100%. 100%. May I say something? Yeah, now let's hear what you say. Sorry about that. You know, I hear everything we have said, and really it's a, it's, a, it's a battle. It's a battle, but I feel in a different way. I feel, you know, they say that you want to know everything. You want to be, you know, a genius and know everything. So you read books and read books and read books and read books, read all the books here, read all the books in it. But you will always feel that is something that is missing. So what I feel, what God did not put us like to be a banging is, is for us or for most of the people is so high. But at least if you do something, you will be in the higher scale that you know most of the people you if you read a lot you will know a lot but again always you can read more and you can know more and there are subjects that need more so what i feel is like if i go step by step and i grow in my step like he says nine million things to do but at least i do three four i agree with you i agree so you are growing you think good you feel that Everything is too high that it's been impossible to reach it. But since I love God, I feel a little closer each step that I, I agree with closer. you. I agree and with this you. This is something that I think God put up because we know what is good and what is bad. Even though it's something, you know, we are hesitant sometimes, we know it. So what I feel is that being is so complicated, so difficult, but at least 
I want to do something in order to be as close as possible. And I did feel good. Even though there's everyone, no question you feel good when you're doing this. There's no question. Who's already banned. That what you said, I agree with 100% also. Even though a Benoni, I don't think that a the Benoni, but a real Benoni, we don't feel like it's a Benoni. We're going, we're going, we're, but the Benoni is, is way ahead of what you're talking about. Meaning to say, the Benoni wants a relationship with God. He wants to be God's wife. He wants to be God's partner. He wants to really love Hashem. He loves Hashem. He does. He loves Hashem. But his love is not strong enough to dispose of his of his evil in the system. And he ends up realizing that I'm so far from Hashem that we just we think differently. What God, like I said, God loves one th- this. I I hate it. I don't love it. God hates this. I love it. I'm attracted. He begins to realize, yeah, if you're measuring my actions, I'm doing fine. I'm growing very well in my actions. I'm getting closer. I'm doing more and more and more and more. It's great. But in my relationship with him, who knows if I'm really ever making any progress. But Rabbi, you you, you told us more clearly that the Neshama is something that is too high. So they need (coughs) our body, you know in order to try to learn some lesson and to have some uh, free will. Because if you are a shama, you die, you are a shama, you don't have a free will. The angel does not have a free will. The shama does. The shama? Here. Yeah. When you are in his... I shama. agree with you. Yeah. So the point is, we came to this, you know, with, with this body and the shama and all this stuff in order to act the free will. And the free will is maybe, I don't know, Maybe several lives or a couple of things. No, no, one do. life. Let's talk one yeah, life at a time. The point is, at least, you know, it's too high for me, but at least I do a couple of steps more to be close. Again, it will not be enough, of course. It will not be enough. But you feel better. I you agree see? with you. That that If you're talking about that perspective, 100%. Yeah, but but, if, but I'm going back to a marriage. Let's go back to the yeah, concept, the, the example of a marriage. A marriage, you told, mar- imagine you told your wife after 30 years, I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing. Hmm? So the, the husband gets, at some point, says to himself, Am I really married to this woman or am I not? My wife is never going to let that happen. Am I really <laughs> interested? Because that's not significant, that's unimportant. In agony, right? Because as close as he has come, to he's not getting close. He can't make that right. final jump. Exactly. I have met people like this in other areas of life. Right. Yeah. They get suicidal. They're not so. The Bainey was never suicidal. But my point is the level of frustration that they achieved. Frustration. They I, yeah. and these are people who, by any measure, are the most accomplished, brilliant, insanely. So brilliant. why are they suicidal? If they're accomplished. So what's their frustration? They don't what's their frustration? Their frustration is, is that they have a goal. Yeah. That they have come, they have come as close to as anybody could possibly come. Yeah. But what's the, give me an example issue. of a goal. Give me an example of a goal. I was in Israel. Yeah. I was on a divorce. My roommate turned out to be a philosophy student from the uh, University of Leeds. It was incredible. We were both philosophy students. So he was a student of a famous philosopher by the name of Gish. I won't go into who Gish is, but the point was that this guy, well, that's basically, I knew Hebrew at that time, I did, now I don't, but back then I did, and I taught him Hebrew like in a day and a half. I mean, it was the most insane thing you ever saw. This guy wanted to commit suicide, literally, in the room, because he would never be, in his mind, as great a philosopher as Gish. So he's mad. Something's wrong with him. That's oh, a man. Th- this, this is a mental ill. Something's wrong with this person. He was a person who understood his own study. To a, That's a, complete a, arrogance, by the way. That's total arrogance. Okay. And so, uh, now Guess what? You're 100 percent. Chapter 28. <laughs> I'm not joking. Dr. Ever talks to the Bainan. Okay, got it. Love it. I found this. I'll be here for now. He tells the Bainan. The fact that you're frustrated that you're not a tzaddik 
because you don't know your place. You don't know your, you don't know your place. Exactly. Stop fooling yourself. Stay in your lane. Stop being there. there. Stay, Stay in your lane. Where, exactly. Where, where, where we need to exactly. Be you don't know your place. <laughs> exactly. You're not meant to be a tzaddik. You're meant to be a bainin. But, but, the bainin said, okay, so I'm meant to be a bainin. What does that mean? I'm meant to fight the rest of my life. Tell me, how does that make any sense? How's that meant to make me feel good? So that's what Al Rebbe addresses in 35. That I'll comfort you by telling you that the the, the the that the the ultimate battle, the ultimate success in battle is every battle that you want. Yes, that's one what second. I know, I know, that's but what you were just but what would but what would that also means is you'll never fully be married to him. What that means is also you'll never fully be married to him. And and he's telling him, you know what marriage is when it comes to God. Winning the battles. He doesn't need you to love what he loves. He doesn't need you to hate what he loves. I'm sorry, to hate what he hates. He needs you to overcome what he hates. That's all. Then you're married to him. That's, in God's eyes, that's a perfect marriage. And he gives two examples. He says there are two types of foods. There are sweet foods and there are spicy foods. I think I told this before. Except you use savory. Savory, right. There are sweet foods and there are spicy food. What's spicy foods? It's bitter, not bitter, but it's it's sharp. What is sharp in the in the metaphor? The sweet food is the tzaddik. Everything is sweet for him. It's wonderful. It's mesh. It's, there's no contradiction. There's no rejection. There's no friction. There's no nothing. It's all a seamless whole. The baini is a friction and he's fighting and it's it's, it's spicy. His life is spicy. Guys, God likes both types of foods. Speak to people. You go to a restaurant. They ask you, you like it very spicy, a little spicy, or yeah, not spicy? God likes it. Depends. If he's looking at the tzaddik, that's sweet. I love that. The baini, that's lovely too. He loves both types of foods. It's spiced up. Okay. He's fighting. He's been, that's what Hashem wants from the baini. And when the baini overcomes every battle, that to him is a marriage. That to him is a marriage. That's what the Al-Tarebbe tells the Baini. Stop being frustrated that you can't marry him the way the Tzaddik does. He doesn't need you to marry him the way the Tzaddik does. He wants you to fight and he loves every time you win that battle. It's spicy to him. It's sharp. It's, 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 it's what do you call jalapeno. He loves jalapenos. The Baini is the jalapeno. Hashem wants variety. The Tzaddik is the ice cream. The Baini is the jalapeno. <coughs> Is, is this the explanation working good? Yeah. I mean, it will. Yeah, but answer my question. I mean, my, my, I think, honestly, that he knew that very few people and yet to, 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 to meet a girl. Very few people would become a Probably. Could be. As long as I agree with you. He you wants try, you to make the effort. The more you the are, right, and the right, great, you're not no, there yet. Nutrition, nutrition, I agree with you. This is true. Is always, it always is nutrition. One of the great well, philosophers, one, one of the great philosophers, Socrates, what he says, the only thing I know, that I know nothing. So, again, what the not by the end. Let's finish. <laughs> this concludes tonight's class. We'll continue next week with Chapter 15, God Will. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs> 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 <laughs>